Let's talk Dreadblades, Fallen Heroes and Demonic Knights with an overview of the Chaos Knights faction in Warhammer 40k 10th edition. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're talking Chaos Knights and in this video I thought we'd do an overview of the faction, talking through all the rules in their index and the Forge World index for 10th edition 40k. So far in Warhammer 40k 10th edition I feel like Chaos Knights aren't in the worst place in the world. Great big chunky stat lines that a whole load of enemy armies can really struggle to deal with, ranking around about mid-table in the win rates, though admittedly a fair bit behind their Imperial Cousins who are standout strong right now, though that might not work out too well for them in the end if Games Workshop does adjust their points costs upwards. They're definitely an army that can compete against the vast majority of the field, but I feel like Games Workshop could probably do a little bit more to shore up their internal codex balance perhaps. In this video we'll talk through all the rules in the index and the ones that I think that are stronger and weaker at the moment. This one's a fairly typical Warhammer 40k 10th edition index plus a few extras. They get their signature Harbingers of Dread faction rule which really goes very heavily into the Battleshock mechanic and the Traitorous Lance Detachment doubles down on that making Battleshock more relevant against Chaos Knights than virtually any other faction. They've also got some supporting rules with the Super Heavy Walker special rule that features on quite a lot of the Towering Knights, plus the rules for fielding them as Dreadblade allies, and then a bunch of supporting rules from the Traitorous Lance, 6 stratagems, 4 enhancements, and then a whole bunch of data sheets, 10 from the main index, plus a bunch of Forge World ones as well which I will also cover here towards the end of the video. We'll also talk through their points costs as we go along from the Munitorum Field Manual. Most of the big knights did go up a bit in points as per the recent Towering nerf, Unfortunately getting caught in the same crossfire as the Imperial Knights for that one. Perhaps meaning that the balance of power for the Chaos Knights has shifted in the favour of War Dogs a bit once more. Starting out, first up we have the Harbingers of Dread special rule. This one's the update to the slightly complicated 9th edition table where you progress through 5 rounds worth of choosing buffs and debuffs. Potentially having some very very layered up special rules by the end of the game. The idea behind it is pretty similar but it super slims down. You just get one benefit from round 1 onwards and one benefit from round 3 onwards. And as mentioned they do really play into battle shock. From round 1 onwards you get the despair special rule. Within 12 inches of the Chaos Knights miniatures enemies must have a minus 1 to their battle shock and leadership tests. Usually a minus 1 debuff is quite meaningful. Changing units from passing on a 6 to a 7 or a 7 to an 8. It is pretty helpful and Battleshock can certainly get in the way of certain units, particularly with their detachment rule making a lot more units test Battleshock, but it's still certainly really quite unreliable, you're never going to be able to guarantee that certain units will fail, and for the ones that the opponent cares the most about, they might choose to use that insane bravery stratagem and turn it off with a command point. Then from turn 3 onwards they get the Doom and Darkness ability laid on top of the first one, this is when they really start to make Battleshock count, getting a plus 1 to wound for any attacks targeting Battleshock foes, really quite a massive damage boost to essentially have army wise targeting those units, and Battleshock units also have a minus 1 to hit against Chaos Knight models, again very very powerful. Unlike a lot of faction rules though, again it is just really quite unreliable, only getting it on round 3 is a bit of a downside. In 40k knights generally have to commit a lot earlier than that due to having loads of vehicles on the table and not being able to hide enough of them behind terrain. You're generally going to have to give and receive blows with the enemy right from early on. Even with lots of rules that hand out battle shock though, it's still going to be a bit unreliable if any one enemy unit fails. Even for the units that you can force tests on, a lot of the time you're basically going to be flipping a coin as to whether or not they fail or not. And if the opponent gets lucky and key units pass, this really isn't going to do all that much. I think it's an interesting enough rule though, and definitely makes Battleshock more relevant for this army compared with virtually anywhere else in 40k. I kind of feel like this is the sort of rule that they could have probably just had from turn 1 or turn 2 though. It doesn't feel quite powerful enough that you really need to wait to turn 3 to get it really. Would have been quite nice to have the major downsides to failing Battleshock function early. Paired with this rule you also get the Forged in Terror rule. This one's the detachment rule for the Traitorous Lance, the Chaos Knight launch detachment. And this one basically doubles down on the same theme of Battleshock, meaning that a lot more enemy units are going to have to take the test, as basically if they've taken any damage or casualties whatsoever, they still have to test as if they were half strength. This rule also activates at 12 inches so it means that when they are taking those tests they'd be minus 1 to the leadership as well. And it does mean it's perhaps a little bit easier to hand out a few Battleshock tests. You can just try and do a little bit of chip damage to enemy units for really quite low investment in terms of your own damage. And at least put them at risk of the annoying Battleshock debuffs plus any damage buffs that you can get from turn 3 onwards. I do quite like this rule, I think it genuinely does make Battleshock a lot more meaningful for the army. 
And without this nice bonus, the core rule for the army I think would be a lot weaker. Otherwise, in the Traitorous Lance, you get six stratagems and four enhancements. Going through the stratagems, first up we have Dreadhounds. This one is one where you get to nominate two war dogs to try and focus down one enemy unit. The nominated war dogs can't attack anything else, but when they do attack your nominated targets, they get sustained hits one. Quite a meaningful damage boost if they were going to be targeting that unit anyway. And those sustained hits go off on a 5 plus if the enemy is battle shocked as well. Again, that's a very, very meaningful increase. And if you can hopefully target one enemy unit that's battle shocked with multiple war dogs, you're going to get a quite nice boost out of this. Seems like quite a nice one for focusing fire with things like executioners and brigands in particular. If your opponent's got one enormous threat that you think is going to just soak up most of your damage for the turn, maybe a big block of terminators or custodies or an enemy knight, this one seems reasonable enough if you think that you're dedicating multiple big war dogs worth of fire into. Seems a bit harder to use in melee though, I think it's mainly going to be a shooting stratagem. For 1 CP we've got Disdain for the Weak, this one's a reactive 6 plus feel no pain type save, or a 5 plus feel no pain against battle shocked enemies. For 1 CP I'd rate it as okay. The 6 plus maybe isn't enormously exciting, not unless you've got an entire big titanic knight that you think is going to get absolutely focused down by the enemy models. It equates to on average a 20% durability boost. So say if you did have an entire abhorrent knight just focused on by a lot of enemies, if they took 20 wounds off it, you'd effectively save around about 4 of them. I think it's perhaps a little bit passable for 1 CP unless you are getting the 5 plus against battle shock, which is a bit situational. I feel like just in general this one's probably going to be a bit more useful than melee compared with range, as at range it's going to be competing against Diabolic Bulwark for a 4 plus invul. Next up for 1 CP we've got Terror Shades. This is where the Chaos Knights bring their pets along and some spooky birds swoop down to devour the souls of the enemies. You can trigger this one when an enemy fails Battleshock within 12 inches and you roll 6 D6. For each 4 plus you deal 1 mortal wound to the enemy unit and heal 1 mortal wound for the knight that's within 12 inches of it. As seems to be quite regularly the case for Chaos Knights, it is kind of situational and dependent on enemies failing battle shock, but for the right unit doing so this could be absolutely massive value. 3 mortal wounds isn't terrible damage output for a stratagem just then and there, never mind the fact that it also heals a fairly valuable 3 wounds worth of knight on average. Seems like it could be really quite a nice little swing for 1 CP. Diabolic Bulwark is the old reliable 1 command point to essentially rotate Ion Shields. Changing the 5 plus Ion Shield save against shooting into a 4 plus, and in general I think that's still going to be a staple. Covers a fair bit easier to come by for Knights in 10th edition, but it's still going to be a big deal against any really high AP weapons, and if it makes the difference between saving on a 4 or a 5, it's usually going to outcompete the Feel No Pain. Next up, there's 1 command point for a Long Leash. This one targets an Abhorrent Class Knight and 3 War Dogs. And until the start of your next command phase, those war dogs count as being within aura range for that abhorrence. I feel like it could be quite a nice one if you just need to turn on a bit more damage, say for some war dog brigands perhaps. With Chaos Knights having quite so few models on the table, they're often going to need to go into different directions and not just all cluster up around one aura. It's probably not really worth it versus getting lines of sight and getting to objectives and things. And if you did happen to have war dogs basically all over the table, that would make sense to have a damage buff like reroll ones to hit at range. I think that could be okay for 1 CP. If you're affecting any less than 3 fairly meaningful damage dealers though, I think it's probably going to be a little bit on the niche side and probably not worth bothering with. In general, I think it's most likely to come up with either the Desecrator for reroll ones to hit at range or the Rampager for reroll ones to hit in melee, and range definitely seems to be easier to use than melee for that. Finally, for the main stratagems, there's Knights of Shade as well. This one's one command point in either the move or charge phase to allow yourself to move through enemy models and any terrain pieces. Quite a fun one just to have some knights go through some ruined walls and perhaps make some charges that wouldn't otherwise have been possible. Just the existence of this one does make it potentially harder for your opponent to screen out key units and they can't just plonk one model in between two ruins and know that you can't get past with a war dog for example. I think every so often that could be really quite big and pull off a surprise move and get a knight right into the heart of the enemy army easily. But knights do still have really quite big bases and they won't be allowed to finish their normal move within one inch range of enemy models. So you will probably still need to be quite close to the enemy unit or terrain piece that you're going to move over to be able to get the knights past. I do quite like the way that it affects two different war dogs or one titanic walker though. Could mean that you could have a bunch of knights ghosting through the enemy in different places. Finally while we're on the subject of stratagems I think it's worth mentioning tank shock as well. Just for converting command points into raw damage this seems like perhaps one of the best ways. One command point for big mortal wound impact hits when you charge. 
You'd be very likely to get the maximum 6 mortal wounds against most targets with a warp strike, claw, big knight, and usually you're going to be getting around about 4 or 5 mortal wounds if you charge in with a war dog with a slaughter claw. Could be really quite a big deal if you're going against targets with high saves or invulnerable saves, or even against hordes that you might not have a sweep mode attack against. Definitely could be one to consider saving a command point for if you just need raw damage. It seems a bit more reliable than a few of the others, perhaps. Overall, I'd say that the Chaos Knight stratagems are okay, but maybe not an absolute standout bunch. Probably the single most reliably good one is Diabolic Bulwark for the 4 plus invulnerable save. The first three, though, seem kind of dependent on your opponent failing Battleshock to get really quite good. Terra Shades looks like it could be excellent if it could go off on two meaningful targets. Dreadhound seems usable enough if Wardog Brigands focus fire, particularly if the enemy is battleshocked as well. And Disdain for the Weak is an okay durability one that gets actually quite good if the enemy is battleshocked with a 5 plus fail no pain. Moving on, we're on to Enhancements, and the Chaos Knights have 4 of them. Aura of Terror allows you to generate another Battleshock test in the fight phase, potentially helpful if it does make the difference between your Chaos Knight wounding normally or wounding on a plus one, but I feel like at 35 points that is a bit niche really, particularly as it's most likely to apply in your own fight phase when you've just charged an enemy unit, and then they'll just heal the Battleshock as soon as it gets around to their next command phase. Would be alright if it cost a bit less, but at 35 points seems too much to me. Aura of Terror for 25 points though I think is a lot more usable, this one gives you sticky objectives, so if your knight either moves away or gets shot down on an objective, then the objective will stay yours, provided you held it in at least one command phase. I think that is quite a nice ability for a low model count army like knights, and the objective marker that's tainted also hands out the despair debuff for the minus one leadership, but that bit feels a little bit situational. You'll probably already have a knight on the objective most of the time to provide that same debuff. And if you don't, it's only going to apply to units that are within, say, 9 inches of the objective but haven't been able to clear it, otherwise they would have just taken it off you anyway. Still seems an okay use of 25 points spare at the end of making a list, though. Next up, for 30 points, we have the Traitor's Mark. This one allows you to get Doom and Darkness from the first battle round, so the chance for enemies to be minus 1 to hit and you to be plus 1 to wound against Battleshocked foes. This one seems really quite nice if you can make the enemy fail some Battleshock tests. So unless you've got some abnormal ways of handing them out at long range on the first battle round, perhaps with some allied skull cannons or something, you're probably not going to have too many enemy units battle shocked right from the game's start, so it might be more relevant from battle round 2 onwards. I suppose it could be nice for things like the Abominant, which can force some tests early as well, handing them out in the shooting phase. Finally, we've got the Panoply of Cursed Knights, which I think is really quite a nice durability upgrade. It is the most expensive one at 40 points, but it means that you subtract 1 AP from enemy attacks targeting your knight, and it works both against range and against melee. Seems like really quite a nice defensive upgrade that one, particularly with how easy it is to stack saves higher with cover saves these days, and this one doesn't have any restrictions about taking it on tyrants either, so with a big tough 2 plus armor save knight, this one seems almost all to include potentially. You make one knight that's just monstrously hard to gun off the table. Out of the enhancements, I feel like my favourite two are probably the Panoply of the Cursed Knights and the Aura of Terror. I feel like these things might at least semi-regularly get used as well, as it's often not super easy to fill the last few points in a Chaos Knight army list, due to Games Workshop's lack of paying points for war gear choices anymore. Overall, I definitely think there's some interesting support choices for the Chaos Knight army, maybe not quite as much just raw damage and defence as the Imperials get. A lot of the things do seem a bit swingy and dependent on the enemy failing the Battleshock tests, which I'm sure will happen with all the debuffs and forcing more tests going around, but perhaps just a little bit unreliably so. Moving on, before we get into data sheets, let's just mention Dreadblades. This one's the Chaos Knight Allies rule, and means that you can include squadrons of Chaos Knights really quite easily in other Chaos armies. If every model in the army has the Chaos keyword, you can either include just one Titanic Chaos Knight or three Allied Wardog models in your army as well. And unlike previously, they don't all have to be war dogs of the same type. You can mix and match, say, one brigand, one huntsman, or one executioner if you'd like. For fielding the Chaos Knights as allies, it means they won't get their Battleshock rules, they won't debuff leadership, or make enemies have to test for taking one casualty, and they won't get any of their stratagems, including the Diabolic Bulwark one, that they could use their Tank Shock. Despite this, though, I think it can still be a very interesting option for quite a few Chaos armies. I think perhaps the most common thing that I've seen allied into other lists are Wardog Brigands, just being really quite excellent little efficient gun turrets. Particularly for armies that don't tend to have a whole load of long-range fire support, things like the Demons or the World Eaters, maybe. I feel like if you just want to add a bit more muscle to the front line, then choices like the Huntsman or the Stalkers are quite nice generalists. A bit of powerful anti-tank with a Demon Breath Spear and some strong melee. And I feel like some of the Titanic Knights are usable enough depending on their role. 
could be a cool centerpiece to an army. I'd say that a few of them might be a little bit less efficient though, due to not being able to use the stratagems, which tend to be more efficient on big knights. And if they have any helpful war dog buffing aura abilities, you're kind of paying for them, but they won't do anything. As if you're taking an allied titanic knight, then he can't take any war dogs. All the supporting rules aside though, let's move on to talk about the actual data sheets for the Chaos Knights. For battle line units, basically all the war dogs are battle line choices. That means you can take up to six choices of each war dog if you want to, so very, very flexible there. It seems that quite a lot of Chaos Knight lists are going fairly heavily on them at the moment. The majority of ones that I've seen often maybe having one or two Titanic Knights and then the rest war dogs. I certainly think it could be viable to just go nothing but if you really wanted to. That's not how everyone likes to play Chaos Knights though. Having them all operate as independent units is maybe a bit more flexible than in Knight Edition as well. You don't have to deploy them together, and they're not fighting for any sort of force organisation chart as well. So you can just literally mix and match the war dogs that you want. Character models are kind of relevant in the army as well. They're the ones that can take the enhancements, and it's basically all the Titanic Knights besides the Acaster Chassis Knights. Plus also, strangely enough, the War Dog Stalker. It means that you could make one of those your Warlord if you wanted to, or give it enhancements, though I wouldn't say they're enormously efficient on it. For common rules throughout the army, the Titanic Knights get the Super Heavy Walker rule. That's this one here, where they can basically step over anything that's 4 inches or less in terms of terrain pieces, and they can also move full back and advance over enemy models as well. So are a bit more flexible in where they can go compared with normal Super Heavies. The Titanic Knights also all get the Towering rule as well, really quite a powerful rule for firepower in Warhammer 40k. Towering Knights mean that they won't be hampered by the line of sight blocking effect of Ruins, so it means that if they can draw line of sight from any point on their chassis, they should be able to see something. And unless you're playing with very, very tall terrain pieces, it means that these guys will often be able to see bigger enemy units behind ruins they might struggle to hide. It can also mean that if you're playing with ruins with windows, then titanic shooting knights will be able to fire at them, but also vice versa. Though at plenty of events and tournaments these days, I've seen people playing it as if bottom floor ruins are close to towering model shooting. There can just be big differences based on terrain tables, whether you're playing on ruins with windows or not, as to whether towering knights can basically see virtually everything on the board, or almost nothing. For most of the knights with big guns, it's arguably an advantage, seeing as they'll be able to get more lines of sight than they would be able to otherwise. For the more dedicated melee knights like the Rampager though, it's a disadvantage really. They can't buy behind ruins, and they don't really have all that many meaningful guns at all, so it does just mean they'll probably be taking a bit more firepower. In the update into 10th, there weren't really any major gained or lost data sheets for the Chaos Knights. They've got pretty much the same cohort as they had before. Still a fairly limited roster as an army that's only really got two dedicated kits for them. But they can make use of the Imperial Knight and Forge World choices to pad out the range a bit more. Finally, just for some common themes throughout the army, in general knights tend to be a bit of a stat check on enemy anti-tank. The War Dogs are the lightest models with toughness 10. The Abhorrents are Toughness 12 now, and Tyrants are Toughness 13. It means that if your opponent hasn't brought enough anti-tank along, then they're probably going to be in for a bad time against Knights of any stripe. And they still keep their signature Ion Shield invulnerable saves at range, with the option to do their Dread Bulwark to get up to a 4 plus invulnerable. Leadership for the army is decent enough, 6 plus on the Titanic Knights and 7 plus on the War Dogs, so they're a little bit more shaky if they get to low wound values on objectives. They all get their special rules thrown throughout the army, and the big knights mostly give an aura buff to the war dogs of one sort or another, in place of the bondsman type abilities that the imperials get. Comparing the two, I'd probably say that the bondsmen are a little bit stronger, seeing as they actually affect the titanic knight itself, though these aura buffs can potentially affect really quite a lot of war dogs if you did choose to bond shop, I suppose, but perhaps rewards an army that focuses more on war dogs than the titanic knights, and just having a few of the big ones and lots of little ones. Actually getting into the data sheets though, let's talk through the War Dogs first, then the Abhorrent Class Knight and the Knight Tyrant, and then move forward into the various flavours of Forge World Knights. Starting out, we've got the War Dog Executioner, essentially the Helverin Pattern Armager, 135 points, and the joint cheapest War Dog. This one's got the standard War Dog stat line of toughness 10, a 3 plus save, and 12 wounds. They move really quite quickly at 12 inch movement, and have got a really good objective control of 8 so still potentially have the ability to take objectives off entire small squads of enemies. I think a pretty solid defensive stat line for the cost, particularly with the 5 plus invulnerable save, and this one's armed with the War Dog Auto Cannons, 8 shots at strength 9, AP minus 1, and damage 3, a mid-strength sort of profile that's fairly effective against most things that you point them at. It'll do at least a little bit of chipping away at both hordes, vehicles, and enemy elites. The AP minus 1 is maybe a little bit on the underwhelming side against anything with, say, a 2 plus save and cover, it's going to be a lot less meaningful if the enemy is saving on a 2, 
but sure at least force a fair few amount of saves to be rolled, and it's really quite nasty against sort of medium armour, medium save vehicles. Otherwise it also gets either a melter gun or a diabolus heavy stubber, this one having the new 3 shots out to 36 inches or 6 shots to 18, and the Chaos Knight's flavour gets the strength 5, AP 0, damage 1. I'd say for the amount of shots that you get, that's probably better than the melter gun in most circumstances, particularly for knights that are likely to be hanging back a bit like this one. It's got a little bit of melee attacks that could kill a light infantry or two, but nothing enormously significant, and its special rule is Executioner. If you target a unit that's below half strength, then add one to the hit roll, and that's enough damage boost, but just really quite limited in the targets that it gets that against. At least for your first opening salvos in the game, it's pretty much guaranteed not to be able to get that. Overall, I think it's solid enough for a cheap generalist, Maybe not one that you want to go absolutely all in on, as the autocannon profile is definitely better against some things than others, and it does have a fair bit of competition from the Wardog Brigands, which are very, very efficient. So I feel like perhaps one or two of these is fine enough to have in the army, perhaps loiter around the home field objectives and chipping in with some longer range generalist fire. Perhaps one of its biggest rivals in Codex Chaos Knights is the Wardog Brigand. This one's 150 points, so a fair bit more than the Executioner, though it does bring some really quite fearsome firepower to the table, and has a really nice special rule as well. These ones get to hit on a 2+, which is really quite nice against modifiers like stealth and things, still hitting on a 3 against that is very nice indeed. And also their weapons get an extra pip of AP when they target the closest eligible enemy unit, meaningful for both of the guns, but definitely very good for the Avenger Jane Cannon. Going up to AP-2 from AP-1 is pretty nice, I think. The Demon Breath Spear is really quite a nice anti-tank weapon. Two shots at 24 inches, strength 12, AP-4 and damage D6, and it gets a massive Melter 4 within 12 inch range as well. Overall, perhaps one of the very best Melter weapons in the game for the points. Nice to actually be able to wound heavier armour on a 4 plus or better. The range is pretty good, and Melter 4 within 12 is amazing. The Avenger Chain Cannon gets 12 shots, hitting on a 2 at strength 6, AP-1 and damage 1. Really quite nice for thinning out hordes, and enough shots to at least put a little bit of damage on harder targets. Between the two it just means that they're really quite general purpose fast moving gun turrets. Then on top of that they also get either a Havoc Launcher or a Stubber. The Havoc Launcher seems to be perhaps the more commonly taken on these guys competitively. Fairly similar damage output, particularly if you can get the plus one shots from Blast. And having just a little bit of indirect firepower can definitely be helpful if you do need to kill one of the last things on an objective or something. I think overall you definitely could argue that this might be one of the very single strongest of all the Chaos Knights data sheets. A lot of lists seem to be running these in massive numbers, anything up to the maximum of 6 of them, and they're quite a popular choice for allying into other armies like Chaos Demons and World Eaters as well. Handy fire support for the armies that don't get it quite so easily. Next up we've got the Wardog Huntsman. This is the more Armager Warglaive pattern Wardog, the one with the Demon Breath Spear and the Reaper Chain Talon. It doesn't have quite as many flexible options as the Stalker, though it does have a different special rule. The Demon Breast Spear, as mentioned, is already very good. And the Chain Talon on this one gets the Strike of Strength 10, AP 3 and Damage 3 with 4 attacks, or Sweep Mode with Strength 8, AP 2 and Damage 1 to deal with Hordes. The Huntsman special rule makes it an anti-vehicle knight. If you attack monsters or vehicles, then you get to reroll wound rolls of 1 and damage rolls of 1. So quite a nice increase in efficiency with those targets, particularly with the Demon Breast Spear. Overall pretty solid, you will be able to weigh this up against the Stalker though, which is pretty much the same profile, but a bit cheaper and with a different special rule, and with different top weapons. The Stalker's 135 points, so a little bit cheaper than the Huntsman, and again equal cheapest variant with the Executioner here. This one again has got the fairly similar profile, but it also gets the character keyword as well, so you could give this an enhancement if you wanted. I guess this could be the de facto leader if you are building all war dogs or something. It could also allow you to use that epic challenge stratagem if that one was ever relevant. This one gets the choice between the Demon Breast Spear or the Avenger Chain Cannon. I guess both of those do have value, though I would generally say that the Spear is probably the better choice of the two. It still does at least a little bit of damage against infantry with a Stobber or something on top. Though I guess if you've already got quite a lot of other anti-tank Chaos Knights elsewhere, then it still might be good just to add a bit of anti-horde if you need it. Then you've got the option between the Reaper Chain Talon, the same as the Huntsman, or swapping it out for Slaughter Claw. The Slaughter Claw just gets 4 attacks at strength 12, AP 3, and a huge damage D6 plus 2. Massively more efficient than the Chain Talon against heavy targets like enemy knights, or even just fairly standard enemy vehicles. But it does mean that you lose the Sweep Attack, which could be genuinely a lot more powerful against lighter infantry if you need to clear out an entire squad. So I feel like there is a fairly meaningful trade-off here, and you can have either one that you prefer. 
For most lists, I've generally seen a few more people using the Slaughter Claw over the Chain Talon at the moment. I feel like both are pretty viable though, and it just kind of depends on what you're fighting or wind up getting to charge. The Stalker Special Rule I think is a fairly good one as well. If the Stalker gets to target an enemy unit that's greater than 6 inches from any other enemy units, you get plus 1 to the wound roll. Really quite a massive boost to damage output there. I feel like that is going to come up from time to time with enemy units fighting over objectives. They might not necessarily have lots of units moving up in concert. Does mean that you might have a little bit of tactical shooting to do as well, maybe trying to deplete a very damaged enemy unit, and then after that you might be able to open up with your stalker's firepower and get the plus one to wound on the target that doesn't have any friends anymore. Again, a very efficient war dog data sheet, I think. I think both the huntsman and stalker are probably fairly equally viable. Maybe if I had a preference, it might be slightly towards the stalker, but I feel like they're fairly balanced overall. Finally, for the main index war dogs, we've got the war dog carnivore as well. The melee specialist war dog that gets the big 14 inch move. This one can get up the board very, very quickly indeed. It is 160 points now, which is maybe a little bit depressingly expensive for a war dog that's going to be right on the front line and isn't any tougher than any of the rest of them. This one has been a bit of a flip from the previous profile where it was the cheapest before. It does at least get massively enormous melee against the other war dogs that you've got. It hits on a 2 plus in melee and it gets plus 2 attacks compared with the other variants, so 6 instead of 4 or 12 instead of 8. Plus you also have more flexibility with the profiles as well, usually either the big sweep attack with 12 attacks at strength 8 and AP 2, or 6 attacks with a slaughter claw at strength 12 and D6 plus 2. Basically anything that you do manage to hit with this guy is going to take a massive amount of melee damage. His special rule is re-rolling charges, handy enough to help you save some command points, and overall I think he's scary enough to maybe have 1 or 2 on the front line. Definitely pays a bit of a premium, and I think a lot of people prefer the more mixed roll war dogs, but I think they're powerful enough to have a big melee threat that the opponent really can't ignore, and that massive movement 14 inches is quite a long charge threat range. Overall, I do feel like Games Workshop has done at least a fairly good job of balancing the different war dogs. I'd say perhaps the Brigand, Huntsman and Stalker are the ones that I'd want to take more of, I think. The Carnivore and the Executioner seem just a little bit more niche, but okay to have in small numbers. Moving on to the big knights next, and first up we have the Knight Despoiler. 470 points, and the most flexible one built out of the Questorus kit, but a bit more flexible than its Imperial counterparts, abling to double up on guns like Double Avenger Gatling Cannons or Battle Cannons if you'd like. The Abhorrent Knights get the Towering and Titanic rules, and it's really quite hard to kill with a toughness of 12, a 3 plus save and 22 wounds, definitely needing some focus anti-tank fire to whistle them down. They move 10 inches, so not enormously fast, though they can step over other models with that super heavy walker rule. They've got the character keyword for enhancements and certain stratagem access, and a really big objective control of 10. If one of these is on an objective, you're going to need a lot of enemy models to take it off them. For the points overall, I'd say that they're probably a little bit less durable than War Dogs point for point. But there's definitely something about having all those wounds just condensed into really one big vehicle. If the opponent tries to kill them and focus fire with a whole load of things and just falls short, it's still going to hit back with a whole bunch of damage rather than reliably killing some smaller vehicles. Then getting onto its choice of weapons, it's got options for ranged melee and canopy guns. The armed weapons can double up and you've got the choice between the 18 shot strength 6 AP2 and damage to Avenger Gatling cannon, the rapid fire battle cannon which gets a really big rapid fire D6 plus 3 attack profile at strength 10 AP minus 1 and damage 3, and you get double that if they're within half range. And the thermal cannon, which basically feels like two demon breath spears stuck together, but it also gets the blast special rule and an enormous melt of six if you can get within 12 inches. I do feel like this one is kind of underwhelming if you're at 24 inches though for the points cost. The difference between getting that crazy melt of six and not getting it is kind of huge. Out of the ranged guns, I think I'd be far more tempted by the Gatling cannons or the rapid fire battle cannons. I think they're at least fairly well balanced. The extra AP definitely helps out against things with high saves but the mid-strength of the Avenger Gatling Cannon can be pretty underwhelming against tougher vehicles. In combat, you have the choice between the Reaper Chainsword or the Warp Strike Claw. On their big profiles, the Reaper Chainsword is strength 14, AP 4 and damage 6, whereas the Claw is strength 20, AP 3 and a massive damage 8. Pretty much flat better for the Claw overall, I think that the extra damage outweighs the AP. But I'd argue that the sweep profile of the Reaper Chainsword is probably usually going to be more useful. It's 12 attacks at strength 9, AP 3 and damage 2. Absolutely murderous to Space Marines and lighter infantry. Though the claw attacks get 8 at strength 10, AP 2 and damage 3. Pretty much exactly what you want if you're trying to fight Terminators. Again, I think pretty good arguments for both of those there. I guess one other thing is that the Warp Strike Claw will get you more guarantees, mortal wounds with tank shock. 
Then for the canopy guns, you either get the Ruin Spear rockets with three shots at strength eight and damage D6, some anti-fly shots with the auto cannons, or a little bit of ignore line of sight shooting with the Havoc missile pod. Out of those, I feel like it's a fairly clear victory for the Ruin Storm missile pod. That was just quite a nice general purpose profile, fairly threatening against both heavy infantry and lighter vehicles. Overall, I feel like the damage output of the despoiler is really quite good, particularly doubling up on either the Avenger Gatling Cannon or Rapid Fire Battle Cannon or going one of each, though I would say its abilities are probably one of the most underwhelming out of any of the big knights. Its aura ability helps out War Dogs with Battle Shock a little bit, though it doesn't guarantee that they pass or anything like that, just gives them a plus one to the test, and otherwise it just gives you either one hit reroll or one wound reroll. Not terrible. We'll probably have the highest value on the thermal cannon, though I would argue that's probably one of the weaker ranged guns, which is a little bit unfortunate. I think I'd be most tempted to run this guy, just spam a whole load of shots either with battle cannons or gatling cannons or a mix of the two, with the Ruin Storm missile pod on top. Next up for the Titanic Knights, and a little bit cheaper, is the Knight Desecrator at 450 points. This one's now flipped to be a little bit more of a range specialist, previously it used to have a 2 plus weapon skill, now it's got a 2 plus to hit at range with its desecrator laser destructor. That gun's really quite a fearsome anti-tank weapon, 3 shots at 72 inches, strength 18, AP 4 and a big damage D6 plus 3. Definitely something that enemy armour isn't going to be able to relax against, and against monsters and vehicles it also gets the devastating wounds ability as well. Very unreliable, but if you do get lucky and roll a 6, then that's going to be big. Just with average rolling with that 2 plus ballistic skill, most of the time you're going to be getting 1 or 2 failed saves against things without good invulnerable saves, though obviously it's going to be very swingy and a little bit all or nothing. Otherwise it gets the same standard pick between the chainsword and the claw. And its war dog ability is quite a good one I think, a 9 inch aura of re-rolling hit rolls of 1. Very nice for basically all of the war dogs nearby by the carnival. Very good for brigands and the executioners, and also the huntsmen or stalkers moving forward. Overall, I feel like this guy's quite a nice one out of the big knights. Seems to be one of the more popular ones. Next up, we've got the Knight Rampager, the sort of gallant equivalent with the Warp Strike Claw and Reaper Chainsword, and just enormous melee. This one's the single cheapest out of the Titanic Knights now. It escaped the towering nerf without any massively meaningful range damage. I like the Carnivore out of the War Dogs, it gets a few boosted stats moving 12 inches rather than 10 to get it there a little bit faster, and then getting the 6 attacks with either the Chainsword or the Claw, hitting on a 2+. plus. Really quite nice to have access to all of those profiles as well, whether you want to be hitting really big stuff, Terminator equivalents, or Space Marines or Hordes. On top of that, just in case it needed more damage, on the charge you also get sustained hits 1 as well, and its buff is to help out friendly War Dogs in melee, re-rolling a hit roll of 1 if they're within 9 inches. Overall, this guy's usually going to be able to kill what it catches, just with average damage output, you'd expect to kill around about 12 Space Marines, 4 Terminators, or around about 33 wounds to a Rhino Tank, or around about 21 wounds to something like a Land Raider or Knight Tyrant. Most things just won't be able to stand against this guy unless they've got a lot of wounds and a good invulnerable save. He could always Tank Shock if he needed more, I suppose. Finally, and perhaps one of its best abilities, is that once per game you also get a very big advance and charge. That means that you'd have an average charge threat range of just over 22 inches. That should be a sort of distance the opponent's going to find really impractical to keep out of the way of, so there's a pretty reasonable chance that this guy gets a fairly early charge off. Being dedicated melee does have its issues though, definitely has the potential to be screened or hit back very hard once he's made his first charge and killed one thing. I feel like in general knight rampages and gallants and things are usually going to be more sort of distraction carn effect style big knights, run in and threaten a whole load of damage and force the opponent to have to deal with them, which is kind of nice as they're pretty cheap compared with the other big ones. It is a shame that they don't have a way to either fight in death or auto-explode anymore though. Next up we've got the Knight Abominant, 455 points and a fairly standard stat line compared with the rest of them, though he will miss his big feel no pain type saves from Knight Edition I think. Perhaps compared with a few of the other big Knight guns, I'm not the most sold on the Volkite Combuster. It does have 9 attacks at a big strength 12, damage 3 and devastating wounds, but at AP 0 a whole load of that's just going to be bouncing off enemy armour saves. It just feels like the sort of gun that can very rarely be relied on to do anything all that meaningful. A lot of the time, you might just not roll enough devastating wounds to really make it count, as a lot of the time, they'd be tanking damage on 3 plus or 2 plus armor saves against more meaningful targets. Its combat profile is interesting in being a very infantry and heavy infantry focused knight, rather than being quite as raw devastating to enemy vehicles and super heavies. 9 attacks with its Electro Scourge with sustained hits, strength 10, AP 2, and damage 3. Already very good there, and then it gets some extra attacks with Bailmace Tail. 
three attacks at strength eight, AP one, and damage two. For all damage output, it's not too far behind the Rampager in terms of damage to Terminator equivalents, but will struggle quite a bit against anything with toughness 11 or 12. Finally, for its special rules, it gets two quite nice psyche abilities. Vortex Terrors gives you a Battleshock test on one enemy unit within 12 inches at the start of your shooting phase. Quite a big deal from round 3 onwards, giving you the option to get enemies Battleshocks to get plus 1 to wound against them. Really quite nice to trigger that there, and far more important than most your turn Battleshock tests. It'll also contribute a little bit of chip damage with Warp Storms as well. At the end of your movement phase, roll a d6 for each enemy unit within 9, and on a 3+, plus, it suffers d3 mortal wounds. Probably rarely ever going to be make or break with that, but a little bit of chip damage when the enemy gets close is okay, I suppose. In spite of the abilities, I will probably rate it as perhaps one of the weaker big knights currently. I think it's still an okay generalist, and the battle shock and the warp storms and things are helpful enough, but maybe just doesn't bring quite enough raw threats to heavies that the other knights have, just meaning that if all that you can get your hands on are enemy vehicles and things, it just might not have quite as good a time. Maybe could just use a bit of a small downwards points adjustment compared with a few of the others, perhaps. Lastly, for the main index big knights, before we get into Forge World things, we've got the Knight Tyrant. These ones are 555 points now, and come with really quite an enormous intimidating defensive profile. Toughness 13, a 2 plus save and 24 wounds. Really quite nice for a lot of enemy anti-tank weapons like las cannons and lances and things, wounding it on a 5 plus. And the 2 plus save is pretty excellent if you can get any cover with it, worsening enemy AP further. And you could even stack that with the enhancement that costs 40 points for the panoply of the Cursed Knights, but just one fantastically tanky knight. In 10th edition, I think they've done at least fairly well to balance the Valiant versus the Castellan patterns of the Tyrant. The sort of Castellan pattern is the one that's a bit more range focused. A Volcano Lance with D3 shots at strength 20, AP5 and a huge damage D6 plus 8. Massively dangerous anti-tank but also very swingy depending on whether you make those 3 plus rolls. And then perhaps a slightly more reliable Ectoplasma Decimator. D6 plus 3 shots at strength 9, AP3 and damage 3 if you overcharge. Very nice for killing heavy infantry. And still threatening enough to punch up against enemy vehicles with a fair few shots. The more valiant pattern gets the Dark Flame Cannon with enormous overwatch. 3d6 auto hits within 18 inches at strength 8, AP 1 and damage 2. Pretty massive in combination with all of its other guns as well. If you do get to overwatch an enemy unit, could well be worth parking this guy within range of an objective marker. The Harpoon is legitimately quite terrifying now as well. Only 18 inch range, but a fairly hilariously deadly 2 plus hit at strength 24, AP 6 and damage 12 with anti-vehicle and anti-monster and devastating wounds, so it's got the potential to be really quite effective against vehicles that don't have an invulnerable save, and perhaps a particularly good choice to command point re-roll, a failed hit roll or wound roll there. The short range could be a bit of an issue though, so opponents might just be able to guarantee that they can stay out of range of that, with the Knight's Tyrant's slightly slow 8-inch move. Then it's got a whole bunch of smaller arms as well, either guy strike missiles or desecrated cannons for your choice of three different top guns, the guy strike missiles get to continue to fire all game long now, just a single shot at strength 12, AP 6 and damage D6 plus 1 each time. They get devastating wounds and anti-titanic 4 plus. All the desecrated cannons are a flurry of anti-infantry shots, strength 6, AP 0 and twin linked. Both seem kind of fine, extra additional damage, and there's some more amount of guns at close range as well, with twin links for a little bit more reliable wounding of bigger vehicles. These things definitely are, still are covered in massive amounts of dangerous guns. Finally, for the Tyrant special rules, it grants War Dogs cover nearby. Definitely handy enough if they have to advance into the open, I guess, though cover is generally not the hardest thing to get in 10th edition. And it's also got a rule called Bastion of Corruption, meaning that enemy units can't set up within 12 inches of it from reinforcements. Really quite a nice thing to have parked on an objective, and protects it from certain close-range attacks like Gene Steeler Colts turning up and throwing a whole load of demo charges all over you. Overall, for the points cost, I feel like the Night Tyrant feels at least pretty playable for Chaos Knight's army. I think that both the versions are fairly solid, and does really quite good work of defending an objective with the deep strike exclusion, and could be really quite hard for some armies to kill between the panoply and maybe cover. Finally, let's talk through the Forge World series of Chaos Knights, the Wardog Moirax, four Sevastus Knights, two Abhorrents, and two Acastus. The Wardog Moirax is 170 points for a standard Wardog stat line. Really quite points intensive for its defensive profile at least, and it doesn't really have the best special rule in my opinion, getting a 0 CP heroic intervention stratagem. Could be handy enough occasionally, but not really very useful for the ranged ones, and a lot of games it's just not really going to come up. The melee weapon it can take is essentially a siege claw, which is basically the same as a slaughter claw, but with a built-in rad flamer as well. 
that one generating d6 anti infantry shots with AP0. Then otherwise it's got the choice of four different ranged weapons of different calibers. Quite a lot of flexibility if you want more anti-tank or anti-infantry weapons. You can get a whole lot of shots out of the lightning lock at strength 8, AP 0 and damage 1. The Volkites give you the chance for some mortal wounds with strength 8 and damage 2. The Graviton guns are really quite general purpose with D6 shots each at strength 7, AP 1 and damage 2, so good against infantry, but also anti-vehicle 2+, plus, so good against tanks as well. And then perhaps the conversion beamers might be potentially one of my favourites. Just the one shot, but with sustained hits D3, so most hits that you get are going to get an average of 3 hits on the target, provided you're greater than 12 inches away and less than 24. That one seems quite nice, at least on paper, at strength 10, AP 2 and damage 3. It does maybe feel a little bit inflexible though, if you can't keep those ranges in the right place. I'd say probably at 170 points is paying a little bit over the odds. Maybe it could be a reasonable one to maybe upgrade another war dog for if you needed to use up a few more points though, and that seemed to be one of the best ways to do so. For the Sarastas Knights, first up we have the Lancer, 465 points, and these get the Sarastas pattern chassis. Generally they've got a movement of 12, though the Lancer being a melee one gets 14, and compared with the standard Abhorrence they get 25 wounds rather than 22. They do have a pretty spectacular explosion risk as well for a deadly demise of D6 plus 2, could be a big swing either way there if you do get unlucky or lucky and roll that. Probably not the worst for the Lancer though, as that's likely to be charging down the enemy lines. In combat, the Lancer gets really quite a powerful attack with the Sevaster Shock Lance, kind of similar to a Warp Strike Claw, but with the 2 plus Knight Rampager attacks and getting 5 attacks rather than 6. The Shock Lance's main strike profile gets the Lance Rule as well, as you might expect, I suppose, so that'd be wounding most vehicles on a 2 plus on the charge at least. Otherwise, it also gets a bit of close range shooting with Strength 6, AP 0, and Damage 2. It has a few other really quite nice advantages. A 4 plus invulnerable save, both at range and melee from that big shield, that does make it significantly more tanky against a lot of enemy weapons there. And I quite like its shock charge special rule, meaning that you get to use tank shock for 0 CP, and can use it even if it was used elsewhere this turn. With that big strength 20 weapon, that's usually going to be 6 mortal wounds on the targets, more often than not. Finally it gets an aura of dark favour, giving war dog models within 6 inches the assault weapon keyword. Not the worst rule in the world, but probably not super ideal on a knight that you probably just want to rush down the enemy with. I guess potentially could be handy enough to support some mixed role war dogs keeping their demon breath spears firing. Overall I think it's still solid enough at 465 points. Really quite fast, really quite tough with a 4 plus invulnerable, and very scary combat. I feel like for the cost it feels at least somewhat balanced with the knight rampager. Otherwise, for the Sevaster chassis, we've got the Knight Castigator, 480 points with the Gatling Cannon that's the similar sort of profile to the Despoiler Gatling Cannon. The same 18 shot, strength 6, AP 2 and damage 2, but this one gets twin links to re-roll the wound roll. I feel like that's really quite a nice advantage, definitely makes it a lot more efficient against tougher targets like vehicles. Otherwise, the Tempest Warblade has the same sort of stats as the Reaper Chainsword. This guy gets to suppress an enemy unit with its Gatling fire, giving them minus one to hit while the Castigator's still on the board. And I feel like as the Wardog buffs go, this one has one of the better ones, giving you sustained hits, one for Wardogs within six inches. Very nice on anything like supporting Wardog executioners or brigands. Overall, I feel like this guy's a really very solid all-rounder for 480 points. Pretty massive melee still. A very good general purpose weapon that's going to be scary to most things, and a very nice Wardog buffing rule. Next we've got the Knight Acheron for 465 points, so one of the cheaper Sarastas. This guy gets a Reaper Chain Fist, again the same sort of profile as the Reaper Chainsword, and pairs that with a Twin Heavy Bolter plus an Acheron Flame Cannon, 2d6 shots at Strength 8, AP 1 and Damage 2, rather than the 3d6 that the Tyrant gets. For the damage output I feel like that's maybe not quite as exciting as some of the other ranged guns, and is again sort of limited in range. I guess it does help with Overwatch I suppose. For special rules it gets one where it essentially burns enemies out of cover so anything else shooting at the same target won't have to get the penalty to their AP for the cover saves. I feel like that's helpful enough but maybe a bit less so when you're paying 465 points for the privilege. I feel like that's probably not going to be efficient enough for the points cost. In the fight phase it gives you an aura of war dogs generating battle shock for the enemy. Not the worst thing from turn 3 onwards. Could give them a bit more chance of getting plus one to wound in combat, though again I probably wouldn't say that that's one of the better rules that it's got. A lot of the time that's just going to be for the fight phase, and it might not be all that meaningful as enemies recover battle shock in their next command phase following it. 
Overall, even at a slightly cheaper cost, I do feel like this one is probably a good degree weaker compared with the Lancer and the Castigator. Probably the weakest out of the Serastus Knights at the moment, in my opinion. Lastly, for the Serastus, we've got the Knight Atropos. This one's 465 points, and this one's the Titan Killing Knight, pretty much. A few differences with the stat line, it gets a 5 plus invulnerable save, both at range and in melee. For its range damage, it gets a whole cluster of anti-tank shots, d6 shots at strength 14 and damage 4, plus another d3 at strength 16, ap4 and damage d6 plus 1, and a choice of different profiles on both of them. Then in combat, it's got an interesting profile with the last cutter, 6 attacks at strength 14, ap3 and damage 4, but with sustained hits though its sweep attack is weaker than most of the other knightly combat weapons, and then it backs up all of those attacks with a plus 1 to hit against monsters and vehicles, a plus 1 to wound against titanics, and an aura of war dogs re-rolling hits against titanics or towering units, kind of handy in certain matchups, but a bit useless in most. Overall, I think that this guy's usable enough, definitely very much a counter-vehicle knight, probably a bit dependent on how likely you are to see vehicles and things in the meta but probably going to be bad news to see on the other side of the table if you happen to be playing either against Chaos Knights or Imperial Knights. Next up we've got the two Forge World Questorus chassis, the Questorus Knight Megera and its counterpart the Styrix. The Megera is the cheaper one by far at the moment, 465 points, and perhaps a fairly standard abhorrent profile, but getting a 5 plus invulnerable save both at range and in melee, so that's one advantage there. Again, its weapon is maybe a bit depressingly low AP, the Lightning Cannon gets 12 shots with sustained hits 2, Strength 9, AP 0 and damage 2. Certainly likely to stack a fair few saves, but not really much threat against enemy vehicles. It backs that up with a Plasma Gun and a Rad Cleanser. Otherwise, you get some fairly standard knightly melee, either the Reaper Chainsword or the Hecaton Siege Claw, and its special rules are to regenerate D3 lost wounds each turn, and give nearby war dogs an aura of ignoring any ballistic skill or hit roll modifiers. Handy enough against things like stealth or any degrading rules, I suppose. Overall, while it does have some fun rules, I feel like this one's just going to struggle to get over the very low AP and damage of the Lightning Cannon. I think in general, if you're paying for an Abhorrent Pattern Knight, then you're going to want something a bit more general purpose than that. Doesn't really compare too well, I think. Otherwise, the Questorus Knight Styrix is the very most expensive out of any of the Abhorrent class knights. A very similar stat line and similar melee, but getting some different ranged weapons and one different special rule. Though again, I feel that this one's probably a little bit overcosted, similar to the Megera. For ranged weapons, it gets the Volkite Kyravial, pretty much the same as the Abominant class gun, and then backs it up with a Graviton Crusher with anti vehicle 2 plus blast and 3 shots. It gets the same Huntmaster rule for ignoring modifiers to nearby war dogs, and then its other special rule is Grav Pins. A debuff to enemy infantry movement after you've hit something with the Grav Crusher. Overall, I just feel like this guy is just a bit overcosted whichever way around you look at him. Not really enormously stand out in anything from the special rules to the melee to the ranged weapons. Not really too sure why it's costing 505 points, to be honest. Finally, we've got the biggest and baddest Chaos Knights of the lot, the Acastus Pattern Knights. 840 points for the Knight Asterius, which is the more expensive of the two. And these guys come with a profile even tankier than the Tyrant Knights. The same toughness 13 and a 2 plus save, but a massive 30 wounds. These things just have absolutely spectacular anti-tank. It gets two twin conversion beam cannons, each one firing out three shots at strength 16, AP 2 and damage 6. But it gets sustained hits D3 outside of 24 inches. And that means that each of these averages around about 4 hits on the targets at this profile. And that's pretty terrifying considering it's got twin links to re-roll the wound roll and that big damage of 6. It even gets a plus 1 strength and damage if it targets enemy vehicle units, and even more against fortifications if the foe has any of them. I feel like this guy's got at least a pretty reasonable chance of ending two big threats with one round of shooting, firing those guns at different targets. I guess the lower AP being a little bit unreliable if the opponent gets good cover and stuff. Otherwise it also gets an ignores line of sights, anti-infantry, indirect fire battery, plus a couple of Bolkite Culverins as well to chip in with a little bit of anti-infantry damage. This one does seem to be kind of skewed to a big knight that wants to counter enemy knights. On average, if you can target, say, a 3 plus save vehicle without a cover save over 24 inches, you average around 40 wounds to that sort of target, though obviously that could get a bit worse with things like invulnerable saves or cover. Finally, at 100 points less, there's the Acastus Knight Porphyrion. 
This one's got the same defensive profile, but trades out those big grav guns for two enormous las cannons, each one getting d6 shots at strength 18, AP minus 4 and damage d6 plus 6, plus twin linked as well to near guarantee the wound roll. Still ridiculously threatening, averaging something like around about 25 wounds to a 3 plus save vehicle, and the extra AP is definitely going to be better against some targets in 40k. They are kind of unreliable though, if you happen to roll low for the number of shots out of them. And then on top of that, it backs it up with a few more las cannons. A choice of missiles, either anti-fly missiles that direct fire, or a little bit of ignores line of sight firepower. I'd probably go for the anti-fly ones myself there. The special rule on this guy is it gets to get lethal hits if it remains stationary, though you might often need to move to get line of sight or things, I suppose, or just move up towards objectives to try and take them. Overall, I'd probably rate it as similarly interesting to the Acastus Knight, perhaps. I think I'd probably be a little bit more tempted by the poor Ferion, not really quite going quite as all in on loads and loads of points, plus the extra AP and damage D6 plus 6 seems nice to me. I feel like they are a lot of eggs in one basket, though, unless the opponent's got some really big targets for them to get their big guns into early. They might struggle to justify their enormous points tags. That's the end of the Forge World Knights though, so I guess that brings us to the end of our review of Codex Chaos Knights now, our big and stompy demon infused death machines. Overall definitely a pretty interesting army, really playing into battle shock, though it does make them a little bit more unreliable. I'd argue for faction rules power, they probably are going to be struggling against their imperial cousins right now, though it might be reflected in points changes later I guess. They can still be a very intimidating army for a lot of other forces out there, just not really able to deal with the big toughness values and lots and lots of wounds that you can put on the table. They do have some pretty fun stratagems, though maybe a few of them seem to be a little bit on the niche side, I'd say. And I feel like most of the data sheets are at least playable. Particularly the war dogs like the war dog brigand seem very, very strong indeed, plus the more mixed ones like the hunter and stalker. And at least for the majority of successful Chaos Knights lists that I've seen so far, tend to include a majority of war dogs and then maybe one or two big knights. I've certainly seen plenty of people taking nothing but war dogs as well. For the index big knights, I think perhaps some of my favourite ones are the Despoiler, the Desecrator, and the Tyrant, perhaps. And for the Forge World, I quite like the Castigator and the Lancer out of the big ones. Both of those do seem pretty intimidating for the price tag. As always, look forward to hearing how your Chaos Knights have been getting on on the table, though. Let me know which choices you've been taking and why, and what's been working out in practice. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, or I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. At some stage, I'll certainly aim to make a Chaos Knights tier list as well. I'm sure we'll get to that before very long. Otherwise, if you've enjoyed all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and that's how I can keep all these videos coming quite so regularly, with new ones out just about every day. If you have been enjoying a lot, any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with the chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.